I think a lot of us are living disconnected um, from our real inner source of wisdom. And the more we remain up there um, and oftentimes render ourselves even unable to make decisions because we can make a court case for and against the same thing and become gridlocked, right? I think thinking pretty simply is, is a form of sabotage or distraction, betrayal. I'm betraying mm -hmm. my inner knowing mm -hmm. that has the answers by keeping myself stuck in that gridlock. Thank you so much, Lisa, for having me. Welcome back again, girl. You know, I freaking adore you. Um, the self-sabotage is so interesting to me. It's something that I hear very common. Once I started to just look, that's the first step, right? Is what does it actually mean? So I Googled it. I looked up the de definition and I was like, okay, it makes sense intellectually. But then what about all the small things that we don't realize we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis that leads us to be 40, 50, 60 years old and look back on our life and say, what the hell happened? Um, but I really do believe if we can address the self-sabotage in the most smallest to the biggest versions, we can start living our lives and being the hero of our own lives. So talk to me, gal, about self-sabotage. Where does it come from? How do we identify it? Absolutely. I talk a lot about, so the language I use, so for any of my followers listening, probably heard me say self-betrayal. It's very much an interchangeable concept. Um, and I think it's a quite universal experience. Um, and I talk about a reason, a reason for self-betrayal or self-sabotage that lives in a, in a part of our mind, in the subconscious part of our mind. Because there's a universal reality that most of us humans share, all of us humans share, which is that change is hard, period. We are very habited creatures. We tend to repeat the patterns that we live day in and day out. And anytime we try to make a choice to go against and to do something different, we meet up against that part of our subconscious that likes to keep us in those familiar places. So we can meet self-sabotage in many contexts outside of self-harm, like you beautifully described, right? We can meet acts of self-sabotage when we don't make that new choice, you know, for a nutritional, um, a, new, a new thing we want to eat or stop eating, you know, or show up differently in the world. Anytime we essentially intend to make a change mm -hmm. and we struggle to keep that intention, typically falls under the category, in my opinion, of that concept of self-sabotage or self-betrayal. And again, it lives in the subconscious that really is driven to keep us in those familiar patterns. So any choice outside of that familiarity can feel like a threat can signal our subconscious, again, making change quite universally difficult and making us engage in those, or making the chances that we're gonna engage in those self-sabotaging choices quite high. And so how do you go from that to then ignoring that thought that's trying to keep you safe? Yeah, absolutely. So first, I mean, something we have to acknowledge is that we have thoughts in our mind all day long. Most of us have a very disempowering relationship with our thinking mind. Um, what I mean by thinking mind is really just the thoughts, the endless litany of you know, considerations, narratives, essentially anything that's chattering in my head typically is happening all day long. And we're vetting the world. Most of us are, are kind of experiencing the world through the thoughts in our head. Mm. And the more we can create space so that we can access a lot of the language that maybe listeners have heard use is the consciousness or the awareness, become the observer mm -hmm. of our thoughts, right? Create space where that which I am that can observe these thoughts is separate from these thoughts. This takes a practice. Um, we have to create that space. We have to learn how to be present to the thoughts that are happening and also to empower ourselves to either maybe shift our attention away from them. A lot of us get caught up in the endless reasons why not to do something. The more I sit on this couch and think of all the reasons why I shouldn't go do that five minute yoga practice, probably chances are I'm not going to do that. So the more time I'm paying attention to my thoughts, that can create enough resistance to not go do the thing. So attention can be a powerful tool, Lisa. I see that first thought there, oh, don't do yoga now, you have this other thing to do. If I am able to, to see the thought and to remove my attention from it, perhaps I put it on my breath that's happening or on the current environment. What, what is here right now that's not in my mind that I can pay attention to, 
if I can remove my attention, I might increase the likelihood that I go do that thing. And a lot of us tend to hook our attention to our thoughts, allow them to spiral, and then we do render ourselves incapacitated to make those choices. Well, okay, so, but if, ah, oh, this is super interesting. So you said, give yourself the space, which I interpreted it to mean, think about this thing, but you're actually saying, don't think about it. So explain that to me. We want to learn how to release a thought. So uh, I do guided meditations often, especially for the healers in my, in my virtual membership. And I often use um, a metaphor that maybe other people have heard in guided meditations as well, but I think it really, it resonates with a lot of people. And it's the visualization of when you have a thought, begin to visualize the thought like a leaf going down a nice stream. So learning how to have that relationship with your thoughts where your thoughts become the leaves. We cannot, and let me repeat this, because a lot of us, you know, I think are misinformed um, about what this relationship with thoughts are, having the idea that we get to go to a place where we have no thought. That's not the case. We're not trying to shut off our thoughts. We actually can't. We want to develop a relationship with our thoughts like they're the, the leaves on that stream where they happen. I can note them, perhaps you're even noting the cyclical nature. Oh, there, I know a couple of mine. There's my to-do list thought. Oh, there's my worst case scenario thought. And then just like the leaves on that stream, I allow my attention to release. And that thought, just as much as it came, will go away. So we're not thinking, and a lot of us do do that. We have the thought oh, right, that other thing I should do. Oh, so now I think of four to-do list things and now I'm down the rabbit hole of to-do list thinking. Um, so one thought kind of quickly turned into multiple. And most of us are doing that outside of our awareness. We don't realize it until we're in the bottom of the well, if you will. So while you're not gonna to evolve to a place where you're thought free, mm. you will retrain the way your brain operates in the thinking mind and that hamster wheel will begin to slow ever so gradually over time. Um, so there are now moments where I am existing in presence, where thought necessarily isn't there. It doesn't mean it's not going to come back. Something could happen in my environment and another thought comes in. Um, and then I have the opportunity to choose, what do I do with it? Is this a productive thought? Is this a helpful thought? Is this a thought I do want to consider a bit more or do something about? Or is this not a productive thought? Is this a thought that I can place back onto that leaf to continue on its journey? All right, so what does that actually look like? You have a thought that comes in, pick a thought. Uh, any thought? Yeah, any thought. <laughs> any, I was gonna say, you know, what thought came up, one yeah. of my common thoughts that I like to think is yeah. I'm not considered. Okay, so you have the thought, I'm not considered. How do you then take that and say exactly what you said? Is this thought useful? Does it help me? Does it not? Like, how do you actually process that? And then how do you make it be the leaf and pass by you? Absolutely. So thoughts are neurons that are firing in the brain. They couldn't be more objective, right? A fire happens, our brain forms a concept. There it is. It's, it's that which is. It's an objective thing. What we do outside of our awareness as humans our brain is what is referred to as a meaning maker. We don't like things to just be as they are. We like to make meanings. And there's rich traditions of mm -hmm. storytelling, you know, passed down through ages where we make sense of the world around us through these meanings. So gift of our very big brains that we have, however, the meaning is what causes then the emotional fallout. Right, so when I assign the meaning of, right, I'm not considered. So while I use that as an example, let me peel it back a minute. What was the actual thought? Oh, a text wasn't returned. So my actual thought was, oh, it's been an hour and I haven't heard from my partner. That's the thought. The meaning I then assigned, mm. I'm not considered. Now I feel not considered. I might feel outright hostile. I might feel wounded. And I might do all the things I do when I don't when I have that feeling. And this is where we're again very patterned. So what we really want to do is pull it back and understand the biggest question or, or understanding that we want to gain for ourselves is what what meaning did I assign to that thought? And when we understand the meaning, we can understand why we're having the emotional reaction that we are. But then that becomes a point of intervention. Now we can question 
the meaning. So a lot of people, I think, are talking about that concept, and there's a lot of value in it because you do have an objective entity, a neuron that is firing, that has now been overlaid with a meaning that can be where we can create shifts and changes. Wow, but even questioning the meaning sometimes scary for people. Mm, really scary. So how do we do that? <laughs> yeah. The work. I mean, I think... But like, know, so let's say you're just really scared, right? Because the second you have to ha take a hard look at yourself, like the, the second you start to question your meaning could be almost like a s identity thing. Yes, yes. Um, which is very scary. So let's say I'm listening, I hear it. Okay, I've got to do the work. Is there like a small little first step, which is like, for instance, people... If you want me to go to the gym, just tell me to get my ass to the gym and I'll go. But for other people, it's like, hey, just put your shoes by your bed. Yeah. Just put your shoes, don't even go to the gym. Just put your shoes on. Yes. That's step yes. one. So almost what would that first little step be? Yeah, here? absolutely. So what I wanted to acknowledge earlier is the work itself is hard. Right. This, this changing and questioning can bring up a lot of discomfort and a lot of the reasons why we're so stuck in our patterns are protective mm. for me as well. You know, living a life distance from my physical body and my emotions meant that I was able to somewhat at least believe I was keeping myself distance from the discomfort. Mm -hmm. So as I began to heal and reconnect with my physical body and my emotional body, there was a lot there that really wasn't comfortable. So I just like to reiterate the work of healing is uncomfortable and it ties into this conversation about self betrayal. Because change is hard, and like I said, within change can come to the surface a lot of deeper rooted feelings, we definitely don't want to overwhelm ourselves. We don't want to overwhelm that subconscious that can't consider doing anything differently, let alone five things. Mm -hmm. So most of us do a disservice to ourselves when we overload our subconscious in two ways, really. The first way is when we try to do too many new things. Completely understandable, especially if my life feels so intolerable right now. Typically, I'm probably really uncomfortable, maybe downright miserable. It is really understandable to have the idea that if I do five new things tomorrow instead of one, right, I can make my recovery quicker and feel better sooner. That's really all we want. So while I wholeheartedly understand the drive to like just change your life from top to bottom tomorrow, I also know that that overwhelms the subconscious. Mm. So in that to that extent, you'll hear me talk about a concept of small daily promise, mm -hmm. where quite literally, mm -hmm. to speak to your beautiful truth, I actually urge you to pick something that's really small. Don't dive into that heart. You know, if you're someone who knows that working out is near impossible, probably don't set that even as your intention. You know, maybe your, your intention is, this might sound silly, is walking to your mailbox to get like just one act action of movement, mm -hmm. right? I walk to my mailbox, maybe it's 10 feet away. That might sound silly. Walk to your mailbox for the next 10 days. And then maybe you walk around your block. And then maybe four months from now, six months from now, maybe then you're finally doing your first, you know, five minute workout. Small promises can help create or walk us past the mm -hmm. resistance that's going to be there. Another way we overwhelm ourselves is we try to dive into too deep emotions. We try to flood ourselves. You know, it's not about remembering that really difficult thing that happened to you however many years ago just to feel it and get past it. That could just as e easily overwhelm the subconscious. So we really want to build structural foundations of safety in mm -hmm. place when we're doing the work. Confidence where I can keep the more small daily promises I keep it's not about even what the promise is. I share, and in my book, those of you who will purchase it, um, ha will read about a story of a very inspirational self-healer whose transformation and really healing from symptoms of MS began with one glass of water. And so what I say to that is, it wasn't the water, <laughs> right, that strung together enough choices, it was the human, right? And so this human, Allie is her name, in the process of making and keeping and noticing the next step of it, notice when you keep those small daily promises, each and every one. In the process, Allie became confident. She developed a sense that she can keep those promises. And that over time expands into what at least I believe is empowerment. Mm -hmm. So those of you listening, it's not about the smallness of the promise. It's not even about the promise. 
when we're talking about healing from self-sabotage and self-betrayal, it's just the act of observing yourself show up. God, I love that. What is, the, I don't want to interrupt you, but what is the difference to you between self-sabotage and self-betrayal? I think they're both pretty much interchangeable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just use the term self-betrayal. I think there's a lot of ways um, because I talk about the ways we betray our needs mm -hmm. often. Um, and I think collectively when we think of self-sabotage, we think of actions where I you know, do myself a disservice. I think we can betray ourselves or even sabotage if you will, ourself by not acknowledging my, my needs in any given moment mm. or putting someone else's, if I do that consistently, of yeah. course, because I'll get questions. Well, I'm a selfless human. I want to show up for others. Of course, I'm not talking, I'm talking about patterns here. If you always are showing up for everyone else and not yourself, maybe that's a pattern you want to explore. And in that way, I could define you, right? You're self-betraying those needs because mm -hmm. you're saying consistently to yourself, that whatever else is more important than your own needs. And I was that person. We don't, likely we're not even aware of our needs, what? let alone have that moment where we decide. And I remember a very pivotal moment um, in my own life before I actioned on it. I was probably in my mid twenties and I was complaining to a friend about all the obligations that I felt were being thrown on me from my family, from my mm. partner and her family and this person over there. And, you know, and I was, Go, going off the litany of all of these requests, you know, that I thought were being given to me. And so my friend very, just very calmly looked at me and said, what, what do you want to do, you know, about the circumstance I've had? I was dumbfounded, at least. I had no idea. I had never even made it a habit or even a, a not even a habit. I never even paused to ask myself. So a lot of times we're just living in that betrayal because we overstep the, the self check-in. We don't take the moment and say, oh, okay, my phone's ringing and it's so-and-so. Well, where am I right now? Am I, am I available to so-and-so? We just are on the phone with so-and-so before we've even checked mm. in. So I like to talk about it in that more, again, expanded way. Um, Cause I, I imagine a lot of listeners are probably doing that, having those moments and might just be by proxy of not stopping to ask. So you're not even giving yourself the opportunity to know um, if you had a different need in that moment. Mm. How do you then do it? Because I, I assume um, you can't do that in every moment of every day. So what would you suggest there for people to kind of um, assess as a overall so that when you get caught up in that moment that you may not have time to stop and go, oh, how do I feel? Are there things that they can do? Is it a list of your needs? What does that look like? Yeah, and the more consistent I think that you are, the more ongoing your conversation with your inner self mm. is, on the daily, because you're right. In these moments, especially if our emotional system is activated, especially if an older wound is being activated, you're not going to, in real time, at least now, yet, mm -hmm. yet, <laughs> you're not going to yet <laughs> be able, right, to, to intervene on yourself. I mean, that's what we're really doing the work of here. Mm. The work is of showing up in consciousness when the older habit, you know, might have been my reaction keeping me disempowered and powerless. And now I get to reown my power and say, no, in this moment, from my conscious self, I am going to do this new thing. Um, so the more ongoing that conversation is, the more we can set ourselves up to succeed in those moments. Mm. For many of us, it's, it's probably a, a I'm blanking on the word when you kind of review a, a sports game after a play, you oh. know, like a post, a post game analysis, sure. something like that. It's kind of like <laughs> a, you know, for a lot of us, it'll happen yeah. after the fact, right? Like, oh, right. I came home and I really didn't want to do that thing. And I realized now I didn't mm -hmm. um, when my maybe emotional brain isn't as lit up. However, the more just in communication we are with ourselves our physical, our emotional, our spiritual self, the better we're going to be able, and you might be someone, a listener might be someone like yourself, and you might find your tell-alls. I have a couple tell-alls myself. When I know I'm stressed, when I catch myself holding my breath yeah. or I catch myself tensing, that one I've known for a bit. Now that I'm tuning in consciously to just my body a bit more and my breathing a bit more and I harness the power of my breath to keep my nervous system calm, I still notice, especially when I'm stressed with work or with things going on in my mind somewhere else, I'll inhibit my breath. So like you, when I'm like, oh, I'm holding my breath right now, Nicole, is something on your mind? Where are you? Are you stressed mm -hmm. about something? So listeners likely will find, right, the, their markers, their tells. That's what we work up to, right? In, in the moment is hard um, and it begins with just 
those small daily promises to rebuild the connection to the self. And then the more in communication we are with ourself, the more we'll be able to note our, our needs, our wants, our desires, our wishes in, in real time. I love that. One of my favorite quotes actually from Bruce Lee, and he says, don't think kick, just kick. And so it's like where you're, you've practiced so much that he no longer thinks about it. He literally just th kicks. So as you were talking, I was like, oh yeah, I guess that is it, right? Mm -hmm. Trying, doing the list, reassessing at the end of the day, like, mm -hmm. re, um, like the football analogy you gave, right? reviewing your day, and then over time just getting better and like shortening that that space of time where something's happened and you're acknowledging your feelings. Yes, yes, absolutely. Because another reality that humans struggle, myself included, is we do, we, we are variable yeah. creatures. So even if you memorized your needs now, you know, I just turned 38 years old, by the time I'm 48, right. my needs are probably gonna shift and change a bit based on my lived experience, based on my changing bodies. So. What we, that's why I'm about that in, internal empowerment, because what I believe our goal is, is to empower ourselves as individuals so that we can walk into the future of tomorrow that is unknown for all of us mm -hmm. and confidently know that we can navigate that with our needs included, because our needs are ever changing. Um, so even, you know, the, the best, the best plan now that we come up with, you know, and I feel like I do more or less a good job when I keep promises to myself to care now for my emotional being and my spiritual being and my physical being, though I'm also aware that my needs will likely mm -hmm. shift and change as I continue to evolve on my journey. So hard truth um, is getting comfortable with that variability, with mm -hmm. that uncertainty of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I believe the best way we can do that is by empowering ourselves with the trust and safety and security that I got tomorrow. It might suck, Right? I might wish it weren't the way it was, and I'll deal with that when I get there, but I have a deep sense of okayness. Wow. I so freaking love that, like beyond measure, because I always want to evolve. I always want to change. And at least growing up, the, the phrase that kept, oh, you're changing, like it was a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I used to think that if I was growing and evolving, that I was betraying other people, I was actually letting other people down. Going back to self-sabotage, I think I was self-sabotaging myself in not changing because I was so afraid of my the people that I love and that I'm close to saying, oh, you're changing. Um, but then I realized, well, hang on a minute, isn't that what we should all be striving for, for growth, evolution, and change? Like to me, that's the excitement of freaking life. Who I was when you were first on this couch is no longer, like I'm not that mm -hmm. same person today and neither of you, right? And it's beautiful to see how we've evolved over time. Um, so let's say I'm t telling Tom, my partner, hey baby, these are my needs, this is what I'm looking for. But in two years, I'm going to be changing and needing different things from you. How do you approach that? Um, because the evolution of it is super interesting. That yeah. I've, we haven't really talked about that before. Yeah. It's really complicated. And I think a lot of times this applies um, with our longest term relationships, right? Our family, our oldest friends, those we've had for decades. I mean, naturally, at least, you know, with our core family units, our caregivers, like we're going to mature and develop. So they're going to naturally see different versions and, and us mm -hmm. them. And I think what most people are fearing is when we fear change and when we kind of worry about other people being different, what we're really concerned about is the effect that that change might have on me mm -hmm. via the relationship dynamic, possibly, oh, here's another theme, being the meaning that I'm assigning now to where I perceive you to be doing or being versus me, right? All roads, a lot of roads, most roads typically lead back to, well, how is this making me feel? in this moment and the reality for a lot of us and i've lived this experience with the large majority of my long-term relationships with my family change does shift dynamics as you start to embody your needs possibly embody your your, your highest self and show up differently in your relationships there are changes then that ripple out i mean this is why i do the work of an individual empowerment because i do believe that that effects far beyond the individual into the relationships and communities and, and systems and structures, et cetera. So I'm not gonna say that change doesn't affect a system, it, it does. And it can make those, especially those longer term relationships complicated. Mm -hmm. What can be really helpful is communication, right? Is just verbalizing. Cause when we don't 
when we're not telling someone directly, you know, when you don't go to your partner, Tom, or, or your friend even, and when you're not describing to them, you know, I'm, I'm on a journey, I'm, you know, going through some things, I might start to show up differently, I might, I might need a little more space. Now you're, you're letting them in, you're, allow, you're at least giving them a version or a meaning that they could choose to accept the next time you actualize on that. Mm. The next time you're not available for Sunday brunch, Oh, right. Lisa told me she's not going to be brunching. She's, you know, on some new mm -hmm. diet. I don't know. But OK, that's why Lisa's not here. That might relieve that person as opposed to you not saying anything and you just removing yourself or becoming more distant. It's not not that I'm saying the conversation is easy to have, of course, sure. though, instead of just actioning on it, like you'll feel my pull away. And then when I'm not at brunch, if I didn't tell you why now your mind is going to do it all of our minds do. It's going to imagine the reason. So now you're leaving that person to imagine their own reasons about what they're probably definitely going to feel is going on. So I think one of the best things that we can do, though it's not easy to do so, some of these conversations are very difficult. I've had to have very difficult conversations with my family in particular. Back when I started to put up boundaries, I had to start to directly, you know, tell my sister, my mom, like things that I was willing to do, not willing to do anymore. And that was hard, though I at least gave them my version of events so that the next time when I wasn't available to them the way I said I wasn't going to be, they could hear the why. And for those of us that love us, you know, for the many around us that love us over time, they can begin to accept that hopefully. It's difficult because like I said, a lot of times it means them changing. Mm -hmm. It means them experiencing you differently. It might mean them not having that role that used to play for them mm -hmm. performed anymore. And they might need to find somewhere else to go with that need. That doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Yeah, God, and them not maybe accepting you. That would be a tough one. But because... a lot of it. I mean, every time, anytime we sh begin to show, shed the conditioned layers and show more and more aspects of our true self, and especially those of us who experience rejection or abandonment, I mean, that's the number one fear that you might not like what you see. Mm -hmm. So I can say to them blue in the face, I'm going to be this new person. And then Lisa, when I show up as this new person, I, I feel very vulnerable because there's always the possibility that you might reject this new thing you're seeing that I'm doing or saying or being. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's super freaking tricky. But I definitely think that we can't allow that to impact how we show up mm -hmm. because then it just goes back to how we first started, right? The self-sabotage yes. of yes. Yes. Um, holding on to something. It's going back to actually meaning and feeling, right? You're holding on to maybe a feeling or a meaning that you had with this person, whether it's your partner, a friend or something. And I think sometimes we hold so hold on so tight to it that we then don't act in accordance to our goals, our dreams, the person we want to be. Yes, I, I, I pretty much, I mean, you're, you're summing up the choices, my yes. vetting point for choices. Mm -hmm. I would run everything that I was going to say or do personally and professionally through the lens of what effect will this have on the receiver? Right. Right. And I got so good at that, that before mm -hmm. I know it, like I was saying earlier, there was no stop of, well, what do I want to say? Right. And what effect would this have on me not saying it in this way? I didn't even consider that that was a step because I was so, I trained myself, my environment, right, resulted in my training to just worry about the receiving. And I'm not to say to be insensitive. No. I'm always listening, especially mm -hmm. on social media, like you and I were talking before. I'm always listening, observing how my messages are landing with the hopes to tweak my language, to tweak the way I'm sending the message or speaking it to allow it to be received. However, the reality is on the receiving end that we all are playing, we're all having those, we're all subjective. We're all filtering it through <laughs> our past experiences, right? And we could really set ourselves up, um, do a lot of disservices around needs and need expression if we're constantly just worrying about how will this land. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we're gonna surprise ourselves or the person. All the things we imagined that they were gonna say or do when we expressed ourselves in this new way a lot of times it never happens. Uh, that's actually interesting that the overthinking process is sometimes in essence a sabotage in itself. I think overthinking is a, a sabotage. I think humans and our thinking brain has become so primed. Our school system trains us to solve all of problems from up here. Mm. Um, I think a lot of us are living disconnected um, from our real inner source of wisdom and 
the more we remain up there um, and oftentimes render ourselves even unable to make decisions because we can make a court case for and against the same thing and become gridlocked, right? I think thinking pretty simply is, is a form of sabotage or distraction, betrayal. I'm betraying mm -hmm. my inner knowing mm -hmm. that has the answers by keeping myself stuck in that gridlock. Wow, yeah, how do you, if you're, whether you're stuck in the gridlock or not, I guess, um, provide meaning to something? I haven't really dove, dove, dived deep into meaning, actually, so this is quite surprising for me, but I'm super interest, interested in how we can cultivate meaning in something to actually serve us. Yeah, serve us. absolutely, and I think being connected to that inner source of, of whatever it might be, whatever word you use for it, passion, purpose, you know, my why, or mm -hmm, whatever mm -hmm. it is, um, I do feel like that is the life force. And it's also a question I get asked quite often, which is how do I find my meaning, my purpose? And I'll speak from my own personal life experience. If you would have talked to me, and there was actually a really impactful moment where um, Lolly, my partner, and I read a lot of the same books. And it was years ago before I really embarked on healing. And I read a book of Dr. Wayne Dyer. I don't know if you have read any of his work. Um, he's, he was a psychologist. And he kind of shifted out and began to do more in spiritual endeavors. Anyway, the short of it is we both read the same book. And I read the book. And it talked a lot about him reigniting his purpose and his meaning and finding it and kind of going on his path. And about a decade ago, or maybe a little less, when I read that, I'm reading it alongside of Lolly. And Lolly's like, oh he's my spirit animal, this is me. And I'm like, oh, I didn't get this meaning chip, this purpose chip. Genetically, I don't have this, like mm. toss aside. Flash forward, I now very much resonate with Dr. Dyer and he's like a bit, I'm like, wow, you know, I really see what you're saying. Um, but I share that because I get asked that question a lot because a lot of people are like me. They're not connected enough to their inner self. To, they might think like I did. I, I didn't get that chip. Genetically, the purpose, you know, gene skipped me because mm. I didn't resonate with that. I didn't resonate with this kind of concept of inner drive or meaning that I heard by that point a lot of people talking about. Um, and it just didn't, it didn't align with my experience so far. And I understand it now because of my body and the trauma. And I was living in a survival mode and talk again about Maslow when you're in survival mode and your core needs aren't met. You're not able to evolve up the pyramid into that tip part of self-actualization, which is essentially, in my opinion, the self-expression of meaning. Mm -hmm. The creation you put into the world, whether or not that's just the energy that I'm spreading because I'm in this way of being, or a tangible creation, a teaching or whatever business you're in, what you're doing, right? That's what self-actualization is, the expression of that. So that's how I understand meaning. Or that's how I'm conceptualizing it. Um, I think we find our way back when we find our way back to ourself, when we balance the body that's often dysregulated, that our mm -hmm. self is housed in, when we understand mm -hmm. our energy systems and how they speak to us. And when we discover that inner self, then we'll get the guidance and we'll be able to find the very individualized meaning that life is for each of us. So the more connected I am, the more I'm able to express from that place. And now I feel very meaningful about what I do. And I can see though, you know, more choices taking me out of that alignment and I'll probably end right back where I started, which is dysregulated, disconnected and devoid of meaning. And so do you just notice yourself swaying and you bring yourself back? I mean, I think it all comes around, what am I doing? What are my choices? Mm. The more I don't do my self care, the more I don't keep those promises to myself to keep my system balanced, the more longer that goes on, mm -hmm. then yeah, I just feel overall more disconnected. Um, I don't string together too many more, too many of those days where I allow myself to sway because I'll start to feel a little bit mm -hmm. not great. You know, a couple days of not moving my body, my energy becomes stagnant, my mind becomes stagnant, and then I make the choice to go re-engage. So I know I'm answering this a little differently. No, I, I fucking notice love it. when I'm in balance, I'm connected and I'm able to express the more from balance I come or I allow myself to sway by not making the choices that keep me in balance, the more disconnected I, I feel from my meaning. Yeah, I mean, look, that is so important to me because like when, if someone was to ask me about like executing a business strategy, I would talk about 
my cognitive, you know, right, what yeah, I do yeah, to, yeah. to power my brain, right? I'll, I'll, I'll talk about sleep and they're like, why the hell are you talking about sleep? Right, because yeah. it's so freaking important. It's mm -hmm. the foundation that allows me to get right, here. Yes. So the way that you broke it down to assess and come back to your meaning is so important because the reason why I actually wanted to go deep on the meaning thing is to me, it becomes an anchor because I always think there's going to be so many reasons why you're going to self-sabotage. You're going to have a million, right? We spoke about excuses in the last episode. It's like there are so many reasons, excuses, you can give that you didn't achieve your goal, you didn't achieve your dream, whatever it is, right? I want to go to the gym. I want to read the book all the way through. Like whatever it is, you're always going to have a reason. And by you sharing how you can come back around and pull your meaning back to be true to you, like that's the freaking juice right there. So yeah, yeah I, lo I love that idea too of you know, it, it using it as an anchor, using it as a checkpoint, almost reverse engineering. Right. And I think there's a lot of aspects, honestly, Lisa, you're onto something and saying that of healing that have that kind of reverse engineered aspect of things. Like I'm sharing with you, there's a lot of actions I took against what my core beliefs were when I started this. I didn't believe myself to be capable. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe myself to be able to make the changes. I, I felt my body to be very limited in a lot of ways. I didn't think that certain emotions were at least sustainable in my life, right? And so yet I acted otherwise, right? I made the small daily promise. I kept walking in that direction. So there's a lot of things that we can begin to do and choices we can, we need to on some level almost begin to implement before we actually shift and, and, and internalize it and make it actually our inner why. So that is you know, another way we can approach this. Um, if you have the end point or an idea of the end point in mind, or at least a direction, you know, sometimes it can start with what you don't want, right? I don't want a life that feels as stressful in the day-to-day -day as this life is. Okay, so I don't wanna walk in this direction, so by proxy, I'm walking in this one, right? And as I walk, I might be able to get clearer and clearer. God, I love that so much. Um, where can people find your book, girl? You've got a book coming out. Where can people find it? Yeah, absolutely. I have a book coming out. And just so fortuitously, talking about our, our conversation today, um, it's called How to Do the Work, How to Heal from Your Past and Create a New Future. So talk about right healing from self-sabotage, healing from self-betrayal, creating a future that's different and not more of that Groundhog's Day. So it's the comprehensive oh, how-to. Um, it's coming out in March, March 9th to be exact. It is on pre-order, pre-sale right now. So there'll be a link, um, an Amazon link, a couple we'll international in links, yep. all the links Stop. will yeah. be <laughs> to be had. Um, know that if you order, thank you, thank you, thank you. And also the book will come out on March 9th. It'll live in the world. And it um, hopefully will give you the toolkit of how to understand a bit more of this conversation on self-betrayal and the tools, the practical tools to begin to create a new future. Awesome. And where can people find you online? Absolutely. The dot holistic dot psychologist. You can find me on the daily talking about healing, doing the thing of healing, and of course, connect with the amazing community of self healers. Guys, guys, check out everything this woman does. She's freaking awesome. Do the work. And also subscribe, click that link and follow me at Lisa Billu. And until next time, guys, be the hero of your own life. Peace out. What up guys, thanks so much for watching this video. If you'd like another dose of bad arsery, make sure you watch this video right here or this one right here, because I know you'll like them. But hey, also, while you're here guys, you might as well click that subscribe button down there so you don't miss any future episodes. And until next time, be the hero of your own life. Peace out.